Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Lab 207 Webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about air. Today's topic is going to be the evidence for global warming. So as always, let me get you some objectives, and we'll jump on in. By the end of this video, you should be able to discuss changes in global temperature and carbon dioxide concentrations, describe evidence that indicates that humans have an impact on climate, and compare and contrast positive and negative feedback systems. Before we even jump in today, I'm going to go ahead and recognize that for some reason, climate change, global warming, whether humans have an impact on global warming has become a very politicized and controversial topic. Today, I'm not getting into any of the politics of it. I'm going to simply give you the evidence we have. So everything you see in this video is what we know empirically and verifiably. So let's go ahead and jump on into that evidence. The question we're going to explore today is, is the Earth becoming warmer and are humans responsible? So those are the two major questions we got to talk about. First, we have to answer the question of whether the Earth is actually becoming warmer. And then once we decide whether or not the Earth is actually becoming warmer, the next logical question is, are humans responsible for that change or is it a natural cycle? And that's what we're going to look at through the remainder of our video for the day. One of the major organizations that you need to know about is the IPCC. It's the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The IPCC was formed in 1988 and tasked with the uh, job of tracking stud and studying climate change. It consists of about 3,000 scientists and they put out reports fairly regularly regarding the state of the climate and climate change and their reports are kind of the benchmark for evidence either for or against climate change. Now, every report that they have put out has become um, successively stronger in their assertion that the world is indeed getting warmer and that humans are responsible for that warming. They just put out their most recent report a couple months ago, and it contained their strongest statements yet, saying that, yes, the world is warming, and yes, humans have something to do with it. Now let's just go ahead and jump in and start talking about some evidence and some of the things we know. So first thing that we need to recognize is that for a while, humans didn't believe that concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere were actually increasing. They thought that as more carbon was put in the atmosphere, then plants would just kind of jump to the task and take that carbon out or that the oceans would absorb it. So there was this guy named David Keeling, and he started doing some work in the 1950s. He decided that he was going to measure actual carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere on a day-to-day -day basis. So he set up an observatory in Mo on uh, Mauna Loa, which is a volcano in Hawaii, and he just started recording carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere every single day. And he found a couple of very interesting things as he gathered his data. And his observatory, it should be noted, is still gathering data today. He found that on a year-to-year -year basis, the carbon dioxide concentration goes up and down and up and down. And he found that during the spring and the summer, carbon dioxide concentrations were down and during the fall and the winter, carbon dioxide concentrations were up, which makes sense if you think about it, because in the summer and in the spring, all of the plants that have been dormant over the winter come back to life, they start photosynthesizing again, and you can see that the Earth collectively inhales as all of those plants pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Also, oceans warm up, and the plankton start to photosynthesize, so they also pour carbon, pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. During the fall and the winter, all of those deciduous trees that have been pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere all summer long go ahead and shed their leaves. They stop pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and the carbon dioxide concentrations go back up. So Keeling found that there was this seasonal up and down and up and down, but overall, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was increasing. When he started doing his recordings in the 50s, we were under 320 parts per million carbon dioxide now today we are up near 390 or 400 parts per million. So even though there's a seasonal up and down fluctuation, the overall trend in the last 60 years or so has shown a steady increase in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So from that, the next logical question is, who is responsible for all of this carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? And as we've talked about all year long, developed nations um, bear the brunt of environmental damage usually, or 
I should say, are most responsible for environmental damage and pollution. But in this case, it's actually countries that are rapidly developing that are leading the charge for carbon emissions. So on the graph there on the left, you can see the comparison between the countries that emit the most total carbon. China emits the most carbon dioxide in the world, followed closely by the United States. And then from there down, it's not even close for other countries. Now, interesting, interesting thing to note about that graph on the left is that China contains about one fifth of the world's population. The United States has a much smaller portion than that. So China has a ton of people, which would make sense as to why they emit more carbon emissions. Now, if you break that down and go per capita, so per person, how much carbon dioxide is emitted, that would be the graph on the right. Per capita, Australia emits the most carbon dioxide per person, followed by the United States. And then if you look way down that chart, you will see China. So if we're going per person, it's Australia and the United States. If we are going for just pure carbon emissions, it's China and the United States. So we've got all this carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and now we've got to move towards the question of, is the Earth actually warming? Now, scientists have been reliably collecting temperature data around the world since about 1880. So we can kind of get a very reliable record since 1880 of whether or not the world is getting warmer. This graph right here, contains a baseline. So at zero degrees, that would be the temperature of the Earth around 1880. And then this line right here shows deviation from that standard temperature. So you can see that from 1880 until about 1940, if you look at the average temperature, the average temperature was actually below what it was around 1880. But then you can see in the 40s, average temperatures starts to go up and above what that standard average was. So if we look at this graph right here, we can see that from 1880 until the present day, the average temperature of the Earth has indeed increased over time. And again, this is from actual like meteorological temperature recordings at thousands of locations around the world. There's this field of study known as paleoclimatology. And paleoclimatology is basically the study of ancient climates. It is looking back hundreds of thousands of years to try to figure out what was going on in the climate at the time. The reason that this is important is if we understand what was going on in ancient climates and kind of how climates have changed over time, then we can take those changes over time and look at what is presently going on and kind of do a comparison to say, all right, what was the Earth doing before humans were having a major impact? And what is it doing now that humans are a part of the system? So paleoclimatology, study of ancient climates, they look at two major pieces of data. The first one is foraminifera, which are plankton that live in the oceans and different types of foraminifera like different water temperatures. And those little foraminifera they have shells that don't decompose every well, very well. So every season, all of these foraminifera die. They settle down to the bottom of the ocean and into the sediments on the bottom. of Year after year, you get layers of these foraminifera building up on top of each other. Obviously, the layers closest to the surface are going to be the newest ones. The layers deepest down are going to be the older ones. Because different foraminifera like different water temperatures, scientists can look at these layers in the sediment of the ocean and get an idea of what ocean temperatures were doing at any given time based on the species of foraminifera that are present in a layer. And then there are ice cores. So in the Arctic and in the high Himalaya, every year it snows. That snow doesn't really get a chance to melt, so it builds up layer upon layer upon layer. As these layers of snow build up, they compress and they form ice. When that ice forms, it traps whatever air was around during the time into small little bubbles. So you kind of get like the layers of a tree in the ice, and each one of those layers has a little sample of the climate of that day contained within it. So what a scientist can do is they can take those ice cores, they can count the layers back to see how far back in time they are going to kind of determine relatively, are we 1,000 years back, are we 200,000 years back, are we 400,000 years back? Ice core data goes back about 400,000 years. And based on the layer, they can cut out a layer and then they can melt it. As they are melting it, special interest instruments will collect and measure the gases that are released. So those would be the little air bubbles that are giving up the atmosphere that was trapped during that time. 
using those air bubbles, they can determine a couple things. They can determine concentrations of greenhouse gases like nitrous oxide and methane and carbon dioxide that were present in the atmosphere at that time. They can also collect a gas called heavy oxygen. So he oxygen comes in two forms. There's light oxygen, which has eight protons and eight neutrons. And there's heavy oxygen, with, which has eight protons and 10 neutrons. Heavy oxygen is more common when the climate is warmer. So using the proportion of heavy oxygen in the air, scientists can make an estimate of what temperatures were like at the time that that little air bubble was formed. Using the data from the ice cores, scientists have been able to construct this chart that talks about carbon dioxide over time. So you can, But you can see that in general, carbon dioxide levels historically, at least going back 400,000 years, have never been above 300 parts per million. But if you go down there to the far right-hand side of the graph, you can see that little point that says current level 2010, almost 400 parts per million. Presently, we are at a spot that the Earth has never experienced before. The amount of carbon dioxide that is presently in the atmosphere is at least 100 parts per million more than has ever been seen on Earth before. So this is one of the pieces of data that gives when the question is asked about whether humans are really contributing to climate change or not. Another graph that has been constructed using this data from the ice core shows the correlation between carbon dioxide and temperature over time. The blue line is temperature, the purple line is carbon dioxide, and the blue line actually shows changes in temperature compared to an average. And you can see that over the last 400,000 years, whenever carbon dioxide has been up, temperature has been up. Whenever carbon dioxide has been down, temperature has been down, and the two lines have gone together over time. So. This leads scientists to ask the question of, well, now that our carbon dioxide concentration is off the chart compared to what we have seen historically, what is the temperature going to do now? <clears throat> excuse me. One thing we don't know from this data is whether higher, con higher carbon concentrations cause higher temperatures or if higher temperatures cause higher carbon concentrations. I believe this is the last graph to show you. Um, this is tracking about 2,000 years of data of indirect measurements of temperature and direct measurements of temperature. And we can see again that over the last 2,000 years, temperature has fluctuated up and down and up and down. There was a period from 1,000 to the year 1,200 where temperatures were warmer. And then we see from 1,200 to about 1,800 temperatures were way down. But that purple line right there shows direct measurements of temperature. And you can see that all the way over on the far right hand of the graph, there's that purple line up to 2,000. That would indicate current temperatures, and this would show us that the current decade that we are in is the warmest decade on, on, uh, on record. Sorry, I thought that was the final graph. This is the final graph. So all of this data leads scientists to the question of, is it carbon dioxide concentrations that is causing global warming, or is it solar radiation that causes global warming? Because obviously temperatures have gone up and down over that 400,000 year period. Before humans were on the scene, it would have to be increases in solar radiation that were causing the temperatures to rise. So some scientists will say, well, maybe it's just solar radiation that is increasing temperatures again. There's a way to look at this question, and the way to do that is to look at where the warming is occurring. So here's the basic idea. If the world were getting warmer as a result of increased solar radiation, then areas of the world that get the most sunlight should be warming the quickest. Areas that get the most sunlight would be around the equator. If we look at our graph right here, or our chart right here, the colors are cor correlated to the amount of temperature change. White is essentially no temperature change. Red is high temperature change. Green is actually cooling. If you look around the equator there, temperature changes on the equator are nothing. They have not changed much at all. So this kind of pushes back against the idea that increases in solar radiation are causing the temperature change because the equator isn't warming up. To look at the question of carbon dioxide, the question becomes, well, are areas of the world that don't get a whole lot of solar radiation increasing in temperature? Because that would point to the idea that the world as a whole was getting warmer as a result of trapped heat, not as the result of more sunlight. And we actually see that those Arctic regions that don't get a whole lot of sunlight are the regions that are actually warming up the most. So this would be the line of logic that scientists use to talk about whether it is carbon dioxide and human activity that is causing warming or whether it is natural cycles like increases in solar radiation. I'm going to finish this video up with two final things very quickly. 
you need to understand the idea of positive feedback systems and negative feedback systems. And just a reminder, a positive feedback system amplifies change. So when we talk about climate change, there are some positive feedback systems that may be at work. If you look at this graph here on the right, you can see the top statement, higher levels of CO2 promote higher temperatures. Now, higher temperatures can lead to faster decomposition in soil. As decomposition of organic material in soil takes place, you get carbon dioxide and methane released. As those gases are released, that puts more carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere, which is gonna to lead to higher temperatures, which leads to faster, constant, uh, faster decomposition. And you can see how over time, will speed up the global warming process, which will in turn speed up the decomposition process and it spirals in a cycle that amplifies itself over time. If we look at negative feedback loops, a negative feedback loop is a loop that decreases impacts. So in this one, we are saying increased atmospheric CO2 increases plant growth. So if you've got more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, then you have plants growing faster, plants growing faster, take more CO2 out of the atmosphere, which slows the growth of plants. So in this case, you are actually turning down the dial and you are reducing change. And I think that's it. I know the voice was gravelly. There's some weird edits. It's morning, it's Monday, forgive me. Hopefully this video was helpful to you. My name is Mr. Kite. This has been the Lab 207 webcast and hope we'll see you again.